to be in the study and make sure that uh, we are aligning our hearts with the Lord. Otherwise, we're going to just rob our entire time. You could have been doing something else this entire hour, uh, and it'd be useless if God's not going to speak to you. Otherwise, you're just being a regular, traditional churchgoer, as a dead churchgoer, I should say, and uh, receiving nothing from the Lord. And that's no, that's no place to be going to church. You guys with me on that? So let's yes. just open up our hearts and make sure that we're receiving from the Lord. Father, uh, thank you so much, Lord, for um, allowing us to come together to hear from you. Lord, we ask that our hearts uh, would fear you, and God, that our ears and our eyes and our everything about us, Lord, that can be open would be opened by you, that your Holy Spirit would come upon us and fill us, Lord, with your word, uh, that we might go forth and just bear good fruit, Lord, that we would be those who... Uh, take action upon your word instead of just speaking your word. Allow us to uh, just be filled with your love. And we know that your love is, is full of action. And so uh, we ask that you would do a work uh, here at this time. And uh, Lord, use, uh, use this teaching, use your word, uh, really to impact our hearts, to shake us up and get us stirred up to go and do what you called us to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there's two men in the Bible that God says they are beloved of God. Two men in the Word of God. One person is from the Old Testament, one person is from the New Testament. The one from the Old Testament is Daniel the prophet. The one from the New Testament is John the disciple. And God refers to both of them. They are beloved of God. And the thing that I noticed about both of these guys, these two characters, is they had a similar interest in their entire life. Everything that's written about them and their interest, just like a lot of us, I can look at one of you guys and be like, sports fanatic, boxing fanatic, gamer, you know, like, I could just, I know it, right? I know your character, I know what you do throughout the day, and I know what you fill your, your mind with, because that's where your passion is. Well, if you look up these two guys and you look at what their interest is and their passion, it's prophecy. And that kind of questions my heart. Lord, should I be into prophecy because I want to be called and labeled beloved of God? Wouldn't you? Did you want to go to heaven and be like, little about God or beloved of God? You know, like, I just, I wonder what God would say to me. When I get to heaven and I just come before him, he's like, oh, and I'll be like, oh, oh no, what is it going to be? Is it going to be bad? Is it going to be good? And I could just only pray that it would be beloved of God, that I love God and serve God. And what would, what area uh, that would be to be labeled as beloved of God? And I think uh, I could go as far to say that these two took an interest in their life in prophecy and from hearing from the Lord. And I think it would be just as good if you and I uh, took an interest in prophecy. A lot of people are against prophecy, think, hey, it's not going to happen. It's all myths and stories that are in the Bible. And I trust in God and he's not a myth, but those other parts in the Bible are myths. I think you should rearrange your thoughts and, and place 100% uh, reliability in the Word of God and making sure you know that it is 100% truth and not fiction, it is fact. And so with that said, um, imagine all of us took a little field trip outside, right? We're out there, we're hanging out, and it was Jesus himself. And he's like, hey guys, I, I, want, I want to show you guys um, a couple of things. And inside the church, there's a stage, and he's talking about this stage, and we're like, wow. And everybody kind of goes home after this teaching that Jesus does, and, and then he, he, a couple of us come up to him, we're like, hey Jesus, um, what is this stage all about? I didn't get it. What are you talking about this stage? And he's like, well, come and follow me. And we walk into the church, and he, he, he has the lights on dimmed, right? And he like dims the light just a little bit on the stage. And the more light that's shed, the more you can see, right, of the stage. And the more detail you begin to see, and the more the, the brightness of the light comes on, the more detail you get to see. And so that's why I pray and I ask the Lord, Lord, open up my heart, open up my eyes to see your word. Because sometimes I can read through the word and I just, I don't understand a lot of it unless I allow the Lord to open my heart. And when he does, it's like that light just shines. And you begin to see more and more detail, fine detail, uh, uh, that illumination, I guess you can say, and that color and everything 
that uh, pertains to what he wants to show us. And so, I look at Jesus, right? Jesus, who was born in a manger. The shepherds came to him, gave him gifts. He was born in a family uh, who, it seemed like there was some kind of stuff happening in the beginning, right? All of a sudden, this virgin, Mary, comes up to uh, her husband, Joseph, and she's like, I've got a baby. And you know, there's all this drama. He's like, how did you get pregnant? We're not even married yet. And there's all this stuff going on for 30 years. Jesus is being just raised, you know, and just hanging out with family. He's got a job. He's working. He's doing all these things. And for the last three years of his life, he's going to go on and do ministry. And you look at these last three years, and then you look at a, a big chunk of his ministry. And a lot of the points that he made in his teachings was actually talking about the kingdom of God. And that's where we get into our study today. In Matthew 13 is just one little portion of a lot of things that Jesus said about the kingdom of God. In fact, I'll just summarize a few verses for you guys so you guys get the glimpse. God is, Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God. Um, and I'm not going to give you all the verses because I can't. But uh, Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 says, And saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus said. Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So right away he already knew, Man, it's on. Ministry needs to go. I need to get this teaching going. I need to train up these disciples because time is short. Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, he mentions in the Beatitudes there. And verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then in Matthew 5, 19, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In verse 20, it says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 8, 11 says, And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Speaking of, the Gentiles would be grafted in. It will no longer just be the Jews, the, the, the children of Israel, coming from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but those who were born outside of them uh, would be allowed into the kingdom of God. And so it's awesome. And that's us. We're the Gentiles, unless you're a Jew here. But... Um, also, it says in uh, Matthew 10, 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And also Matthew 11, 11 says, Surely I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And then it says in verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. In chapter 13, verse 11, he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And he's, Jesus is talking about, hey, the, 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 the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and all these people are gathered around. Jesus is teaching in parables. The disciples take Jesus aside, just kind of like my analogy here, where he brings him aside and they're like, could you explain a little further on this? Why are you speaking in parables? Why don't you just tell them straight out? And he's, he pretty much tells them they don't, they don't know. They have no clue of the things of God. Yes, they may know scripture, but they don't know the things of God. They don't know the heart of God. They don't know where those things are coming from. They know the generic writing, right? The verses in the scripture. Uh, but they don't know the, the real meaning of it behind it. So um, I look at this verse and, man, God forbid that this would happen to this church. That we would, at first, we have a zeal for God, we have a knowledge of God, we're, we have a great relationship with God, and like a shooting star, we're so on fire that we just burn out. And then God goes in and He gives, right, everything that we had to others. Just as the children of Israel who walked with the Lord, loved God, God gave them the commandments, God gave them everything to stand for and live for, the statues, everything, and, and they 
What did they do? Jesus came to them and they crucified their own Savior. And, and that's exactly today. Uh, the church starts off so well, and all of a sudden they get caught up in denominations, and they start to rely on organizations, and they begin to not call out to the Lord anymore. There's no need for faith and trust in God. And the church, a lot of churches, they, they, they give in to just this religious atmosphere where it becomes traditional, right? Just like today, in our service as well, we do worship, we do teaching, we do worship, right? We pray for uh, the tithes and offerings at the end. Uh, we come together, if anybody needs prayer afterward, and there's fellowship, we go and we eat lunch together, and there's just this family atmosphere. We already know what's going to happen next. We don't need anything to show us, oh, this is what's going to happen next. And it gets traditional. And sometimes we can allow that tradition to take over us, and we forget, hey, it's about the heart of God. We come together to glorify God. We come together to worship God. And sometimes we come together just for the tradition of doing the regular routine. And it's a dangerous place to be in. Uh, well, we got to just make sure that we take heed to. Um, I told you guys to turn to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, it's in verse 19 that, that talks about Jesus says, or actually says, right, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. And, oh, it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place. The seed is the word of the kingdom given to man to produce, well, first, what, salvation, obviously, right? But it's to produce the fruit of God. In our lives and if you go through uh, the teaching of the kingdom you'll see that greed uh, those who are with unbelief those who don't even understand that uh, or or even allow the Lord to uh, speak to their hearts that they are to go through persecution they're gonna have trials and suffering those who don't understand that the kingdom of God is not for those kind of people and it's a sad thing uh, that there's people that don't understand these things of the Word of God. They, they pick and choose. They, they grocery shop their churches, right? Just like we go to the store. I go to the store almost all the time. I, in fact, this month alone, I was like living in Walmart. I knew everybody by name. Hey, how's it going, sir? How's it going, John? How's it going? Right? I just, I knew everybody that was there so much. But we cannot do that in our walk with the Lord. In our faith with the Lord, there is no picking and choosing of religions. Jesus is our relationship. He is our religion. He is our life. He is our sports. Everything you can think of, it's got to be Jesus. If it's not Jesus and it's religion, you're in trouble because then you are committing idolatry. You're placing something before God. That is idolatry. To put even your church above God. Only God deserves that respect and that reverence and that awe. When you say to somebody that you, hi, reverend so-and-so, when you read the Bible, only God deserves that reverence, right? And we're, we're wrong, and that's where we're tricked and deceived because we're the younger generation, and a lot of us weren't trained and taught by our older people, right, that should teach us. Because they didn't teach us, we go on deceived and calling others reverend so-and-so, or you guys get where I'm going? And it's, it, hey, I understand the respect part, but the reverence part, that's a whole other ballgame there. And God deserves the glory. It's a hard thing for people to understand that. These will all keep you from the kingdom of God. Those who uh, look at the word of God and they, they, they develop their churches and they gather together and they, they come together and they, they see verses in the Bible where God says, hey, you will go through tri trials and tribulation, right? You look at uh, John says that. You will go through these things. They'll skip right through that. No, you won't. Hey, there's people today, so-called Christians today, that believe in a health, wealth, prosperity gospel, right? If God's not prospering you, then financially, they mean, or healthy, or in, in other ways, materially, then God's not with you, and you're doing something, you're living in sin, God's against you. But what's going to happen if the economy falls apart? What's going to happen if there's a nuclear disaster here in America, the whole world just falls apart and chaos is happening. There's another great depression. Well, you don't have financial needs. Oh, then I, I mean, it must mean God's not with you anymore, right? 
You guys see where these, these doctrines are dangerous, and it can ruin you, or it can strengthen you. You see, for me, hearing about these doctrines only gets me further into the Word of God to test these doctrines, and that I grow in a more greater understanding and knowledge of who God is, and all, my faith is increasing in God. My trust is increasing in God because of these fallacies of man and these areas that man puts together. But they don't understand that you face a, a huge hurricane that's coming your way. And it's, it's dangerous. When you first become a Christian, you give your life to the Lord, the whole world then begins to turn on you. They, uh, because why? They're in rebellion against God. And if they called God, if they called Jesus Beelzebub, how much more are they going to say against you and I? You guys get what I'm saying? See, a lot of churches don't even let their congregation know that if you become a Christian, hey, you're going to go through a lot of things in this life. And it's going to be chaos, and it's going to be things that you don't want, but it's not about you. You see, when you read the Bible, it's all about God's will. God's will be done, right? Well, what makes us think it's all about our will? God, I don't deserve this. God, I don't want this. God, this struggle, this, this death in my family, this thing that happened right here, oh, I don't, me, no, you, and then all of a sudden we turn it on God. Well, you're supposed to be my genie. And God's all, uh, I'm God. <laughs> really? <laughs> this is amazing. Um, and we got to recognize, though, that the world, they are, they're offended. They're offended when you begin to live for God, when God comes in your life and changes you, or if you begin to uh, take on this Christianity, religious Christianity, without a relationship with God, then you're just taking part of the world, and you're going to be against believers. You're against Christians. So when you come to Christians, everything negative is going to come out of your mouth to these Christians, and nothing's going to be good in the life of another Christian. And you're always going to be like, you do this wrong, you do that wrong. Why? Because your heart's in rebellion. And you've got to come before God in love and, and, and sincerity. And we've got to be an encouragement to the body of Christ, right? See, you guys get where I'm going here? I'm trying to just, I'm, I'm, I'm jogging your brain around Scripture just so that you understand uh, where we're coming from here. But when you start thinking right, you start doing what's right, you start uh, speaking the truth, even in times of pressure and, and, and times of just tough times, Man, the world is going to hate you. The world is going to come against you all the more. Isn't that true? Man, I remember at work, just I, I was good. I, I would actually, here's my job, that I'm supposed to perform what I'm getting paid for. I began taking on, not a, it was a sales job, right? I'm doing sales. I'm going out and I'm washing cars. I'm going out and being a greeter. I'm going out and, and being a shell driver. I was going out and, and hauling cars. I was doing a rental car job. I was doing all the positions, right? I was being a manager. They gave me the key to the whole place, and I was supposed to lock it up that night, and just, I was in charge of all of that. I had to do all the paperwork and do all that stuff. When my job was this, I was doing all of that, doing above performance, and still, yet, every employee, even the managers, came against me. Not for the job, but they came against me because of my relationship with the Lord. I didn't go up to them and be like, Hey, you need Jesus, repent! I, I, I showed them the gospel by my actions. And that made them come up to me, and, and be, they knew something was different, and they wanted to talk. And a lot of them, uh, I hope, received salvation, but at least they prayed with me and they received the gospel. I don't know if they received the word of the gospel and into their hearts and they're alive and living now. That's not my problem, right? Our our lives are to be shining before the Lord, whether man receives it or not. And so the Lord, man, put it on my heart so much today about um, the kingdom of God. And I think it's very, very important that we understand it. In Matthew 13, verse 40, look at it with me. It says in verse 40 that, Therefore, as the tares, Jesus is saying, are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness. So these angels are going to come in, and they're going to throw people 
in, in hell, pretty much. So everybody, man, I, I realize, even myself, I want this. Everybody wants a warm and fuzzy Jesus, right? <laughs> oh, it's so warm and fuzzy. Everybody wants this wonderful gospel. Hey, Jesus, come into my life. Save my life. Forgive me of all my sin and my guilt and my shame and just take that away from me and allow me just to walk in peace and love and joy. and Oh, it's just so wonderful, right? And God's all, okay, but there's also more to it. I'm going to give you all this other stuff. And you're like, no, 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 I don't want all that other stuff. I just want this good part. You guys get where I'm going? We can pick and choose our own gospel, and it's a dangerous place to be in. And God is going to come against those who don't fear him. Those who are, and what, what happens? When you pick and choose that kind of a gospel, you're really coming against the testimony of Jesus Christ. You're coming against what the word of God is saying, and you're not being an example to this world. You are being in rebellion against God, even though you're living, you're a churchgoer, right? Call yourself a Christian, you go and you pray. Maybe you even give the gospel to people, right? You're like, here's what the Bible says, here's what, it, let's pray, brother, you know, like, let's get together, woo! You do all these good charitable things, and it's wonderful, and you think you're an awesome Christian, and you stand before the throne of God, and you just got this huge excitement, you're like, hey, God, what's up? And you, why are you so far? Why are you so, what, what are you, ta what, huh? how'd you know, what, uh, but, uh, just, me? Wait, where am I going? You guys get where I'm going, and God says, I don't even know who you are. Get away from me. And for everlasting life. The Bible says, right here actually in this passage, if you read on in verse 42, it says, And will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You see, their fates, these people, even those who call themselves Christian, but don't have a relationship with God, they will be in a place of wailing, gnashing of teeth. These teeth are going to be gnashing together. Your senses will be alive. You'll be able to see. You guys remember uh, when the uh, Lazarus saw um, Abraham? He's in hell. I and mean, there's a whole different, the Jesus was on the cross. You remember he says today to the thief, will you be with me in paradise? Well, all that to say is you can see in hell. You will have your sight. You will have your hearing. You will have the smell because it says in Revelation that it smelled like sulfur in hell. You will be having your filling because it burns with fire. You will be disgusted because there's worms that don't die. Imagine, do you guys like worms? Would you guys ever, uh, if there was a bathtub full of worms, would you just like get in there and kind of throw them around you? No, right? You'd be like me. I'd be like, oh, get out of here. Burn the house down. I don't care. Right? It's disgusting. Or would you want to be around fire? Now, fire is hot. And if you guys have been burnt by fire, imagine that constantly and forever. In fact, the, the, the littlest words that are going to be in, in hell are probably going to be the word forever. The loudest words you'll hear, it's probably forever. Just the, the, uh, the reality that you cannot escape hell. You cannot get out of there. You're stuck and you're stranded, and there is no escaping. In fact, Revelation 14, verse 9 and 11 says, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will, be, will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will, but he will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, speaking of Jesus. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, and for anyone who receives the mark of his name. That sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? There's no, oh, time out, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting right now, i got to go rest. Uh-uh. It's non-stop. Hell is not there for your uh, anything about you, right? They don't, hell doesn't care about what you say. Just like a forest fire. And if there's a forest fire coming right at you, you're like, wait, hold on, it's just getting a little hot. Can you back up a little bit? You guys get where I'm going? It's going to happen. And once you're there, there is no escape. And so if you, even hearing this message, don't care, Chances are your life is heading in a place that, like that. 
And chances are, if the more you know about hell ought to get you to run closer to Jesus, right? The reality of it should get us to just, man, all the more, Lord, I'm going to jump on board, I'm going to get in your word, I'm going to do whatever it is to get there. And when you realize, and you get in the word, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> and that's the perfect thing and the awesome thing about being a Christian is the wonderful thing, and you read from the book of John, it's about abiding in Christ. Hey, God just wants you there to be his friend. He doesn't want you there as a servant that has to accomplish all these things just to show that you're worthy to go to heaven. It was Jesus who was worthy to go to heaven who took your place, who allowed you into heaven. Get where we're going here? It's, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. So his works become known in you. The more you pick up your cross, die to yourself daily, you begin to pick up Christ in your life. Your heart starts to beat the beat of Christ. Your words start to speak the words of Christ. Your eyes only see the things that Christ would see. You get to hear and listen to the music, you guys get on going, all those things that Jesus would hear. You begin to go to the places that Jesus would go. You find yourself around people and not distracted by today's technologies, right? Where a lot of people get so distracted. This week, I started playing a game, and I realized just the, how fast, like, my mind could get just stuck. And I had to be like, whoa! I had to, like, back off. And I was like, what? Man! My baby's crying, the phone's ringing, there's all this stuff going on, and I just want to play the game. <laughs> you know? I had to put myself in check and realize, man, it's amazing. I can only imagine those who play games or watch movies or they're so consumed in these things that the world gets them, distracted and alone and away from others and away from the church and away from, you get where I'm going? The world has plans for you just as much as God has plans for you. And it's all about choice. You see, God will never, he will never force his love upon you. And that's the wonderful thing about love. Love is always a choice. You choose God. God chose you, but you got to choose God. And that's what love is. That's where partnership comes in, in play. So, not only uh, the outward wicked people, the false pretenders, uh, the, that mock the Lord, They're, not only are they going to be removed and enter into this place of wailing and gnashing of teeth and, and where the smoke never dies out, but I believe um, the damned in hell will know that there is no getting out. There is no escape, and it's a scary place. But those in heaven are going to shine forth like the heavens, like the stars, and it's just going to be a wonderful time to come before the Lord and hear the words of God Imagine that, just hearing his words. I don't even know if he's going to speak to me in English, or am I going to know Hebrew all of a sudden? Or All I know is I'm going to hear from God, and I hope I understand what he's saying, right? And I'm pretty sure I will, because I'll have a glorified body. But, um, man, just to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, that's all. That's all I want to hear. Once I hear that, I don't even care. Lord, what, what, what is it? I'm good. You know, get where I'm going. Man, I don't even want to go to hell at all. And I don't want to go to heaven because there is a hell. I want to enter into that relationship and I want to choose that relationship. Because it's not about heaven, it's about Jesus who is the creator of heaven. If he created it, guess how many heavens he can create? He can create as much as he wants. It's not about heaven, it's about the person, not the place. And so we got to realize that Matthew 25, Jesus always, he also talks about the parable of the virgins, the oil, and, and there's five who had oil and they were prepared, and, and the other five, they did not have oil in their lamps, and they were not chosen to come. Uh, you guys can read the first 11 verses there in, in Matthew 24, but or 25, I'm sorry. But you can realize, hey, are you going to be caught off guard? And, and what's going to happen? Um, speaking of like the health, wealth, prosperity gospels and things like that, are you prepared now with that relationship with God? Or are you going to be like these false converts, these five virgins who did not prepare their hearts? They didn't prepare for the wedding feast. They didn't do nothing. They allow themselves to be distracted by the things of this world. Are you going to be prepared? Are you going to allow your heart to be excited and rejoice? Right now, 
and, and I'll get this, I don't want you to get confused here, but the kingdom of God and everything about God, right, in heaven, is all about Jesus, right? That's what makes heaven what it is. The kingdom of God in that aspect of that relationship can start now in your heart. Even if you call yourself Christian, you can start all over and make sure that you know that you're a Christian and that you have a relationship with God. And that excitement and that dancing and that joy and that peace and that everything that comes from the Lord, that fruit, that those gifts, Galatians chapter 5, uh, Romans 12, everything that God has, you begin to allow the Lord to do in your life now. Now, this is not heaven on earth at, in no sense, right? But that relationship can begin even now. And that relationship can take you further. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. Uh, it says in verse 31, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which is a man, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the, her the herbs uh, and becomes a tree. Now we know that mustard seed is a huge plant. It's not a tree, but right here, it's a tree. Uh, could be speaking of abnormal growth. Something's going on there. So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now the kingdom is like a small seed starting with, well, what? Prayer of repentance. And it started so small when you began to give your life to the Lord and you live for the Lord. Your life is for the Lord. You want to glorify and honor God and you ask Him to change your life. And man, at age 13 for me, that was my case. I grew up in the church. I loved God. I prayed to the Lord. I loved reading the Bible. But no way was I Christian. I could care less about a lot of things about God, but did I have that respect? Oh yeah, I did. I was not about to cuss in church. I was not about to do things I did at school at church. I lived a double life. But it was at age 13 when I realized the gospel in my life, that I needed Jesus into my life. I needed an actual relationship, and I took a little check in my heart, and I realized that I needed him, and I called out to the Lord. And I, I, even at that moment, I even got baptized physically. It's really crazy how it all worked out. And I, and I even questioned in my heart, and I asked the Lord, Lord, if you are true, if everything that I have known about you in the Word of God and everything I'm hearing uh, of this gospel being preached to me is true, come in my life and change my life. And <laughs> God definitely came in my life and changed my life. I can testify that God came and changed my life. No longer did I live the life that I wanted to live, and the plans that I had, they got forfeited and just quit. Everything that I wanted to do, I realized, was going to take me down the drain. And everything that I knew God wanted to do, I wanted in on it. And I wanted the Lord to use me to do what He wanted to do. And it changes everything. Um, man, pr prisoners are released, you know? And, and, and speaking of those who are in bondage to the world and, and to their sin, when God, when God calls you... And he calls you. And it started at that little seed, maybe even at that prayer. And it begins to grow into a huge tree. And like Psalm chapter 1, you're just blessed. The, the more you stay in the word of God, the stronger you're going to be. No matter what comes your way, the winds, the struggles. Hey, compassion, love, right? All these things that you've never experienced start to just come out of your life. You never loved your kids, and all of a sudden you embrace them, and you just love them, and you spend time with them. All of a sudden, there's this compassion. You, you, the, the family you drove by every single day that you went to the store, all of a sudden you're at the store, and you're thinking about them, and you're praying for them, and you start to buy them groceries, and you stop at their house, and you give it to them, and then you bless them. All of a sudden, all these weird things start happening to you, because it's the gifts of God, and God's gifts are not irrevocable. All the promises in Jesus are yes and amen. And it's a wonderful thing that we can come to the Lord and God produces these things in our lives if we would allow him to produce it into our life. Well, Matthew 13, says the kingdom, he talks about the kingdom never stops growing. Man, it, until Christ comes, you will continue to lay aside all the filth and the sin and everything in your life that doesn't glorify God. And you continue to grow in Him and it gets better and better and better. Everything that you've known of God gets better. And it's amazing. I love it. Um, in fact, 
In Matthew 13, 33, if you just read 33 with me, it says another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Now, leaven, um, by the way, speaks, it's spoken of 98 times uh, in scripture, and every time it's a symbol or linked to evil. Leaven is never a good thing in scripture, but it, it had to be removed from the Jewish homes during Passover. Uh, it was excluded from almost all sacrifices uh, in the Bible. Jesus used it as a picture of hypocrisy, uh, false teaching, and worldly just cowardness uh, Jesus spoke of. But Paul used leaven to picture carnality in the church uh, and also to about false doctrine. He talked about the leaven. So leaven was never a good thing, but it's spoken here as growth, and it, and it grows. And in fact, Matthew 25, 14 says God gave, uh, speaks about God gave us all his gifts to glorify him. And notice this, his heart is your treasure. You see, your treasure shouldn't be a brand new GMC Denali truck, right, for Christmas. Oh, I can't wait, right? Oh, it's the brand new latest, greatest iPad, you know? <laughs> like, wow. No, no, no. Your treasure should be the heart of God. Is his heart and the things that he loves and the, is everything about him, is that what you treasure? Or is your treasure here on earth, the things that would burn and rust will kill and moth can eat? Get where I'm going? Um, where our investments lie. It really, it's, it's amazing where our hearts can go. But um, those who hear, look at verse 23 of Matthew 13. It says in verse 23, but Jesus saying here, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Oh, I love it. Those who hear bear fruit. Those who don't hear, they're not going to bear fruit at all. Now, we don't walk the same path as the world. Man, we walk a narrow path. The world looks at us, they don't understand us. They think we're strange. And that's why I love when people tell me, man, you're, you're weird. They just, they, it's just weird. They just, I'm like, you're weird. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you Christian? You know, I don't get it. They don't get me. Why don't you do the things like we do? And it's because we're on a different path. We, as believers, are on a narrow path. They can't see it because it's so wide their way. But when they look at God's way, it's like a needle. It just, it's a tiny little, so hard to stay on the path, right? So many temptations and so many things to go for. But if you choose Jesus, there is victory at the end. There is a celebration at the end. There is eternal life with Christ at the end. And that's all worth it to me. Um, man, this, this world is crazy. I love, I don't know if you guys have heard the old DC Talk song. It goes, uh, people think I'm strange. Does it make me a stranger, right? My best friend was born in a manger. I could just keep going, but I love it. I always think of it for Christmas too. I don't know why. But anyways, um, look at verse 24 of Matthew 13. It says, verse 24, another parable. By the way, this is where I want to start our teaching. I'm sorry, guys. You guys are like, wait, we're starting? Um, this is another parable uh, he put forth to them. And by the way, this word another means a loss. Uh, an means another of the same kind or another of the same sort is really what the word there means. But it, it's, it's the man... Uh, that sees the treasure, and and really, if you think about it, you're, you're willing to let go of all that you have to gain everything in Christ. And this is the parable that he's going to begin to go over. And I want to just make sure that you guys recognize this passage here, that you recognize, hey, is the relationship with God everything? Are you? Do you see it? Do you see that treasure? In fact, let's read this parable. It's verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather them up, the tares you also uproot, and the, root, the wheat you with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares 
and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, uh, this is pretty intense, by the way. Uh, it's amazing. When you see the treasure, when you see the heart of God, you're not looking at what your will is, what you want and your desires, but now you're looking at God's desires and God's will. And when you see God's path and when you treasure his path, you're going to leave all behind. You're going to forsake everything and you're going to go for it. In fact, your security and your heart needs to be found in God alone. Uh, not in this world. Hey, this field, right, is, is speaking of the kingdom of God. Um, and only God hears the cry of those in need. He's going to hear those who need him. He's going to hear those kind of prayers. But if you're like a lot of people this season who are praying to Santa Claus... Right? For their own good. I hear this in the, the voices of little kids. They, they, they say, I want this for Christmas. I want that. And I just had some of my nieces over last night and gave them presents. But before we give them pres presents, I let them know everything. Do we sing to these decorations? Do we dance and worship these things? No. I explain to them why we give gifts and, and the main reason of the, Jesus sacrificed everything became our ultimate gift. And we are just showing an example of one another of what Christ already did for us and, and choosing to give to others and not receiving for ourselves. And they're like, what do I get? What about me? What about... I was like, oh, did you listen? <laughs> we didn't get it. Okay, who cares? Oh, it's tough. But it's, it's amazing. Um, it's not our ways. It's God's ways. They, the world, they live for their own desires, their own lusts, their own ways. And they cannot see who God is because their sin has blocked their passion for the Lord. And they will never, ever, ever come to the Lord because they get absorbed into the world and they allow themselves to live that lifestyle. And at the end, their end wasn't the end that they were expecting. They're expecting to go on. Some of you are expecting to go on until you're 90 years old. But it could be today. It could be tomorrow. And all that expectation did you no good. It was that heart that God was crying out to you and asking you to enter into that relationship and you denied him by thinking you're going to live on. But you're not in control of tomorrow just like none of us here are in control of tomorrow, right? Only God is. And God knows and God has the keys over death. He's in control of all of it. Um, Matthew 13 verse 24 uh, was really speaking about how God... God is that treasure. God knows everything. In fact, Matthew 13, let me take you guys on a quick little trail. Um, we're given eight parables right here in this chapter. To cast, mean, parables really means to cast down or uh, to lay down or to make a comparison. Really looking at heavenly truths comparing with earthly illustrations. Um, but these are kingdom parables. Speaking of the kingdom of God, in fact, here in Matthew it says, uh, it says, uh, the kingdom of heaven, but I think it's uh, Mark and Luke says the kingdom of uh, of God. It's kind of quoted differently, but here in Matthew it says the kingdom of heaven. But these are uh, really kingdoms speaking of rule and reign, right, of God. But look at verse 24. It says another, and you guys know, like I said earlier, it means a loss or another of the same kind. Not a different kind, but the same kind. Um, look at verse 31. It says, another parable he put forth to them. So notice the word another. And then look at verse 33. It says, another parable he spoke to them. He goes on talking about the leaven. But this is another, all speaking in the same context of the parable of the sower that's there in verse 18. And he begins to explain it and go further in verse 24 to 30. And then he explains that in verse 36 to 43. But... These deal with growth as well. Look at, look at verse 22. These ones are speaking of growth. It says, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who uh, hears the word and, care, and the, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Look at verse 23. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. Uh, who indeed bears fruit, there's the key word, and produces, another word, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So you see that there's the bearing fruit there. Also look at verse 30. It says, 
let both grow together until the harvest, and at the, the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So speaking of growing, and then verse 33, speaking about the leaven, and leaven grows, right? You only need a little bit into the dough to make the bread rise up and go everywhere, where it says another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of mill till it was all leaven. So there's there's that growth going on there that this parable is talking about. But there's a second set of parables here, and it's in verse 44. Notice the first word says again, and this word really is speaking about moreover, uh, really talking about um, value and placing value uh, in everything. Look at verse 45. It says again the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven. So again means moreover or furthermore. But uh, what, what makes these different is the deal, they deal with value. So first there's those verses, the first uh, part of the parables that talk about growth. And now it's going to transition and start talking about uh, value. And where do you place that value? Um, look at verse 44 is talking about treasure. Verse 45 is talking about pearls. Verse 48 talking about the dragnet that's full of fish, and they bring it in uh, into vessels, and the value is the fish, and it's talking about the value there. Verse 52 is talking about your treasure. Um, so there's a whole bunch of value. It's talking about growth and value. Matthew 13, verse 24 through 30. Uh, talking about the tares, uh, the word there is zizania, I think is how it's pronounced in the Greek. But the, the, the dor, darnel is really the, the word for that. Uh, really speaking of impure or false counterfeit. Um, and that reminds me of this, uh, that wheat that grows in Israel. There's something called lilolium temelantrium. It's another word for a plant. You like that? Uh, it's common in, in, in the Palestine area, and that, uh, all that area. It resembles wheat, except upon maturing, it comes up. Uh, and the grains are actually black when it's time for harvest. So you don't know if it's wheat, because it looks the same. But, uh, but the seed is actually, it's like a drug, right? It gets you all, it's narcotic. And, and, it, and it actually has a lot of poisonous properties. So if you eat of it, you just, you, you, you're dead, pretty much. It's a lot of poison. But the tares is really bad seed. Um, and these are Satan's counterfeits, really, you can say, uh, to the true Christians. You, you can't tell the, the difference until the harvest. And that's crazy, but I know it's true. I can't expect each and every one of you guys in this room to know the Lord. Each and every one of you guys might come up to and say, Hey, yeah, I'm Christian. I love the Lord. If I told you guys to raise your hands, you guys all would. Now, I, I don't know if all of you are Christian, but I do know during the end of the harvest, and when the Lord comes, when everything happens, and we all stand before the Lord, there might be some of you guys who are not going to be willing or able to even stand. You guys are not going to stand with a humble heart. You're going to stand in brokenness for what you've done. And you're not going to enter into all that God has prepared for you. And that's a sad thing. For coming from me, hearing from the Lord, praying for you guys so much, and then at the end just to find out, wow, how in the world can somebody sit and hear the word of God preached at them so long and so much, and yet their heart was that rebellious that they still did not choose a relationship with the Lord. And that breaks me. breaks my heart to even think that that's possible here in our group today. It's a sad thing. You know, for Satan, man, it's almost like that. You can't, you can't beat him. You might as well join him, right? So back in Egypt, Satan tried killing all the uh, everybody there and uh, over the last 300 years, we've seen over uh, 10 Roman emper emperors. They killed thousands of Christians, thousands of believers. But uh, even like in Egypt, in Exodus chapter 1, um, the more they aff afflicted them, the more they multiplied and they grew. And Satan had changed up his strategy, changed up his ways. And when he did, in about 313 A.D., uh, he used Constantine. He made, uh, he made really uh, Christianity kind of like a national religion kind of a thing. And he brought in a lot of pagan holidays. In fact, he even got what well, believers, right? We celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus Christ, and we, we come before and we worship the Lord. He made that day a pagan holiday, which was on the 25th, and he put them together, and you guys, you guys could study all that on your own. But 
Uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that he did. In fact, Satan uses this counterfeit. You don't even know it, and it seems so Christian-like and so wonderful, and, and really it's a mask, and, and you don't even see it coming. In fact, there's counterfeit Christians. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 26, he says, I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brethren. Man, the church today teaches on books instead of the Bible. And I'm so sad about that. They're like, wow, did you guys hear about the latest, greatest word, whatever they call it, the author, and he came and he did this, and let's take out, we just purchased all these books for all of you, let's open our pages of chapter seven, right? And they, they actually teach on books of man. They don't teach the word of God in churches anymore. I'm shocked. I'm amazed that you can go to church and read a book and you don't read the word of God. That's not a church, by the way. It's a dangerous place. You know, there's also a counterfeit gospel out there. Uh, Paul says in Galatians chapter one, verse six, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And so, wow, do you want to be accursed? Better find out what the real gospel is, right? There's also counterfeit righteousness, and I'll end with this. Romans 10, 1 uh, says, Brothers, my heart and desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own way. They did not submit to God's righteousness. There's that counterfeit righteousness where people put on their... Uh, dress, right, and <laughs> their outfits, into thinking they're clean on the outside, but on the inside they're dirty and they're disgusting. Even Jesus rebuked people like that. There's counterfeit churches. Man, uh, Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich, and I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, Jesus said there in Revelation. There's also a counterfeit Christ that are out there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the Antichrist, right? He's going to come on the scene. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, man, how then does it have tares? You see, the question is a confession that they have been asleep, these servants, back in Matthew 11, uh, or 13, uh, verse 24, the, the parable. And, and you read on verse 28, read with me really quick, verse 28. He said to them, an enemy has done this, the servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? See, the servants didn't know what happened, but the master was awake. Guess what happened to the servants? They were asleep. They did not understand what was happening. The enemy came in and they were, they were asleep. Jesus said, be awake, be sober-minded, be alert, be uh, knowing what's going on. And a lot of us today, we get so caught up in our church and we forget our neighborhood, we forget our city, we forget our America, right? The place that you live in, the country. We forget all these things and what your country is going through. Um, verse 29 is talking about where, where thorns and th the thistles are uh, clear and open. Man, we better, we got to watch out. We, we can't be so quick to see something and take action. You, you want us to go and just rip them out? And the master's like, no, 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 he's using wisdom here. Just let them grow up, and at the harvest, man, then you can just pull them all out, but lest you pull out the wheat as well. In verse 30, he's talking about um, the time of the harvest, speaking of the end of the age. Now, nobody knows the end of the age. Hey, the rapture can happen at any moment. We don't know. It could happen 10,000 years from now. I don't know when it's going to happen. I do know Matthew 24, that it's got to be. For me, I can say this personally in my life, and I'm totally confident. It's got to be our generation but I don't know. Nobody knows, right? You can only assume because of the signs that have been given. Um, but it's amazing of all this. Verse 30, gather the wheat into my barn. And what a peaceful tone this statement is. All gathered, all recognized that the Lord's green, right? Kind of saying that all housed in his storehouse. Well, Spurgeon said, I'll leave this 
a Spurgeon quote, guys like that. Uh, he says, He who does not believe that God will cast unbelievers into hell will not be sure that he will take believers into heaven. And that is so true of a quote. In fact, verse 43 says, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That reminds me of Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Or it says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so let it be, um, that may be your life that speaks of God, and not speaking as an example of how the world is and how Christians should stay away from people like you. You guys get where I'm going there? Make sure that your heart is right with God. Make sure that you know the gospel. Make sure that you are a part of what God is doing. If you're not a part of what God's doing, get out. Hey, if I'm not a part of what God's doing, I'm out of here. You guys get you with me on that? I think we're all together on that. Make sure you know the Lord. Man, don't waste your life in regular religious church services, right? There's a lot of things that happen in churches and Church is good. We need to gather together. It's totally biblical. But don't let yourself come in and rob yourself of not hearing from the Lord. You're in a dangerous situation in that case. Your life eternally is in danger. And I pray and ask of God that you guys would see the treasure and that you would go for it. If you knew that there was going to be a billion dollars just going into one stock, right? And you knew that if you placed all that you owned into that stock, that it would go up so much, you guys would do it. You guys, if, if you knew how to do that, right? <laughs> you guys would do that. Whatever it was, hey, see the reward and go for it. There's a finish line, and it's very, very close for some of us. we got to make sure that we push all the more, all as hard as we got, right? Run that race with all that you have. But make sure it's in the Lord's grace. Make sure you're running in God's power and His strength, not on your own flesh, because you're going to get nowhere in that case. So let's go and pray, and I pray that you guys are just encouraged. Um, Father, thank you that your word is powerful. Your word is scary. Your word is awful and terrible, Lord, at times. Speaking of uh, just the tragedy of this world and where a lot of this world is going, uh, Lord, it's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty place. But we know your kingdom, Father, is where you dwell and where you are. There is peace. There is comfort. There is love. There is dancing. There is rejoicing. And I ask, God, that those uh, who hear this message will take heed to their own lives and they would call out to you. They would ask that you would come into their lives and change them, that they would repent of their sins, that they would no more live the way they live in the direction of the world, but rather walking on that narrow path with you, that they would lead a righteous life, and that they would live uh, in the fear of who you are. And I ask God that you would humble all of us and allow all of us to uh, come before your throne. And uh, Lord, just not have a, a heart that's high and lifted up, but rather have a heart, God, that's just willing to take heed to every single thing that you ask of us. Even if you ask us to go through suffering and trials and pain, Lord, may we do it with the rejoicing within our hearts, knowing that it's your will that we're walking in. And so allow our hearts to be checked, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.